Good morning. I am reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing nets out into the water, for they were fishing for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And immediately they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John. They were in a boat repairing their nets. He called out to them, and at once they also followed Jesus, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands. And then a quote from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream that you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, who continues to call people of faith to influence our world boldly. In this time of worship, we pause and reflect and listen. Imagine and be inspired to be instruments of your grace and goodness in our world. So in these moments, we ask you to open our eyes, open our ears, open our minds, that we might discover who you are and what you are calling us to be and to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I have long been fascinated by what's called the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the first three books in the New Testament whose purpose was to tell the reader or the listener about the life, work, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, whom we call the Christ. The word synoptic comes from two Greek words that means to see together. For centuries now, scholars have studied Matthew, Mark, and Luke in parallel, meaning that academicians literally create columns and place the various stories or teachings or actions of both Jesus and his disciples as an attempt to discover where there's unity or disunity between the three writers. In my library, I have several volumes of what's called a harmony of the gospels, with one of the volumes graphically titled, The Life of Christ in Stereo. The three writers wrote out of their very different experiences with Jesus. They interviewed people of faith that assisted them to understand the story of Jesus from various perspectives. The Gospel according to St. Mark is considered the earliest account of the life of Jesus that survived the vicissitudes of time, dated around 65 of the Common Era. Mark's Gospel is thought to have been the book that sat open in front of both Matthew and Luke, serving as an outline for their research and their writing. Mark could have been a modern day police reporter because of his focus on the facts, just the facts. Seldom did Mark go into detail about events or give any interpretation for what was said or done. Mark was perhaps the needle and thread that wove the first century church together, linking the life and teachings of Jesus with the birth and growth of the first century church. Mark was the son of a wealthy woman in Jerusalem 
whose house was a gathering place for the early church that was mentioned in Acts 12. Mark was the nephew of Barnabas and went along on the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, functioning as the secretary for them both. Some believe that the fracture that occurred between Paul and Barnabas happened over a disagreement about the role that Mark was playing and the influence that he was given. Later in Paul's writings, there must have been a healing of the relationship because Mark was actually imprisoned in Rome with Paul and assisted during the writing of the book of Colossians. And then toward the end of Paul's life, as he was preparing to pass the mantle of leadership on to Timothy, Paul wrote him saying, have Mark with you because he has been most useful to me. Well, stylistically, we discover an urgency about Mark that's unusual, illustrated by two words that he used very frequently. He used two words immediately and straightway. Those two words are found some 30 times in his gospel, introduced actually in the scripture that I read just a few moments ago. Think of it, within the first 15 verses of his book, Mark had Jesus on the move, building his leadership team of unlikely characters. He began his recruiting by inviting Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew, followed by James and John. The way Mark told the story made it seem miracul miraculous, as though Jesus didn't have a clue who these four people were. But I doubt seriously if that was the case. When Jesus left his home in Nazareth, he most likely moved to Capernaum a town of about 1,500 people located on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. According to Josephus, the historian of the Jews, there were over 300 fishing boats in business on the Sea of Galilee. Many of those fishing merchants had become adept business persons with contacts to supply fish to markets in Rome and Jerusalem. It's possible, maybe even probable, that Peter, James, John, and Andrew had heard Jesus in his teachings. It's possible that they had developed a relationship with Jesus from his visits to the docks and purchasing fish for himself. Any good leader is always on the lookout for kindred souls, and there must have been something about the way those four merchants did their work that seemed compatible with the vision of ministry that Jesus had for his future. Did you notice how Mark phrased it? Simon and Andrew were casting their nets. And Jesus called to them using an image that they were most familiar with. He said, come. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And immediately, they left their nets and followed Jesus. A little further down the dock, James and John were in their father's boat, mending their nets. At least from Mark's perspective, there needed to be a balance of skills between casting and mending. Until this week, I had never noticed those two distinctions before. Just Jesus didn't ask them what they believed. He didn't ask them why they believed it or if they could support his theology. He didn't ask if they had investigated his purpose or mission statement, nor did he ask if they could commit to his ethical standards of behavior. Simon. Andrew, James, and John were ordinary folks going about their daily work with no special pedigree or background. Yet Jesus saw something in them 
and they saw something in Jesus that captured their mutual imagination about the possibilities for the future. Theologian and activist Chad Myers wrote about how that the fishermen on the Sea of Galilee were part of a caste system that had been exploited and that Jesus' invitation was a way for them to escape their bondage and start a new life. The author claimed that it was the beginning of a pattern in Jesus' ministry to raise up the exploited and the disenfranchised people of his day and give hope to people who didn't seem to have much hope. In response to the invitation, all four of the fishermen said, yes. Not maybe, not let me think about it, not what's the time commitment or what's my benefit package or what exit strategy is there if it doesn't work out. A simple yes was all it took. And what a marvelous example of the transformative life-changing power of faith it really is. It's particularly intriguing to me that Peter, James, and John were considered the inner circle of the disciples of Jesus. Not only did Jesus trust them to be his confidants and advisors, they also became the trio of influencers as the church was being born. They were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder because the boldness they exhibited in taking on some of the most challenging of issues and challenging decisions that needed to be made as they organized and did the work of ministry. It's actually hard for any of us to ever imagine what the church as we know it might have become without the sons of thunder. So why is this important for today? Allow me to take a few moments and try to connect the dots. It seems to me that we need bold action today. People of faith have gotten so complacent. The community of faith needs action-oriented people in a way that perhaps we haven't needed in a very, very long time. We are living through one of the most difficult years in all of history. I hope I live long enough to read what historians will write about this era that we are trying to survive. The stress we feel is palpable. There are layers of challenges and stress that are both unique and yet the same for all of us. We are all carrying worries about our health, job security, finances, emotional well being, as well as many other concerns. Our various stressors and challenges have the capacity to either unite us as we weather what's, what we are going through, or it has an equal or greater capacity to fracture us to the point where healing is sometimes elusive. We are today facing three simultaneous crises. The first, of course, is the pandemic, whose one-year statistics are so immense that it's hard for us to process the enormity of illness and death and grief. Many of us are simply confused. We can't quite conceive that there are people who continue to believe that COVID-19 is a hoax and refuse to practice wearing masks or staying safely distant or washing their hands regularly. The second crisis is a political crisis that has given birth to violence and a polarization that's threatening the infrastructure of the historic foundations of democracy. Plus, the third crisis is that we have a racial day of reckoning that has been building for centuries that cannot be sidestepped 
or procrastinated any longer. The things that are tearing apart our society are also fracturing communities of faith. While there is overwhelming evidence that people are steadfast in affirming their belief in God and their regular spiritual practices of prayer and meditation, they are also deciding to leave organized religious involvement at a rate of 2.5 million people every year. In the world in which we live, what is Jesus calling us to be and do? Certainly, disciples are needed. Clearly, leaders are needed. But I don't believe, friends, that the call of Jesus today is necessarily to go out and preach the gospel and save souls, as important as that is. But our call is to influence our world positively with a commitment to genuinely love and care for people. Our call today, I believe, is that we are being called to be authentic and transparent with our fears and our needs, our anxieties, our hopes, and our dreams. I believe Jesus is calling us today to be congruent with what we say we believe and how we live. I believe Jesus is calling us today to be confidently and boldly engaged in orchestrating change as we humbly walk with our God and doing the work of justice and peace, loving and being kind. The good news, friends, is that Jesus is still calling us to ministry. Ministry is all about us. We are called to be in action, boldly be in action. The challenges may be different today than they were in New Testament times, but the call is the same. Like Simon and Andrew, like James and John, can you say yes to following Jesus? Think about it, will you? The call is for bold action. Can you say yes? Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. We trust that God has spoken to you through our praying together, through the liturgy, through the singing, through the scripture, through the message. And now I leave you with a historic passage of scripture that is a beautiful benediction. Hear it. Take it to heart. Practice it. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain within you always. Thanks be to God. Amen.